Your Creative Push, episode 308. Literally all you're doing is the more you do it, the more you do, you know, paint the ugly stage and then turn it into something really cool, is you're proving to your brain that you can do it. And then you will start to trust yourself. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Fieldy. Fieldy, a.k.a. Haley Fields, is an Australian artist with over 16 years of experience in art and design. She specializes in street art murals, portraits, painted surfboards and skateboards, as well as commercial illustration, all created with a style that combines realistic painting with a cheeky retro old school tattoo flavor. And she comes on the show today to talk about her initial interest in art and the thing that made her put it off, and also the way in which surfing brought her back to art. She talks about the way in which the limitations and restrictions of surfboards themselves as canvases helped her to develop her style and her advice for honing in on your own style and then knowing when it's time to shake things up and move on with your art. Fieldy also talks about how her studies in graphic design helped her to create a brand for herself and the way in which people on the internet curate their work and their lives to make them seem perfect and how she wants to show that she makes mistakes and how she actually fixes them. She also talks about preparing for and getting through those ugly stages in your art and also the importance of taking breaks from your work. Fieldy also talks about the importance of having someone in your life who will support you, but also give you honest feedback about your work and your progress. She also talks about how she reacted when her murals were vandalized and how having another career is not necessarily a bad thing for artists. And finally, that important advice that if you don't ask, you don't get. Since Fieldy and I started talking about having her on the show, I've been watching her videos on Fieldy TV on her YouTube channel, and I've really been enjoying myself and chilling out, and it was an absolute pleasure to talk to her in real life about her art career and her take on creativity, and I know that you're going to be inspired and blown away by my guest today, Fieldy. Enjoy. Fieldy, welcome to Your Creative Push. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for being here because um, I love your art and I love your um, the, like the vibe of your art, but also the vibe of I've watched so many of your YouTube videos and stuff, the tutorials. And you just have a very cool vibe. So I'm, I'm really happy to have you on. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Oh, you're welcome. Um, anyway, before we get into like YouTube and kind of the point you're at now in your career, I was hoping maybe you could take us back and tell us kind of the journey that you went on to get to the point you are today. Well, basically, I think like a lot of artists out there or creative types and that, I always wanted to be an artist. That was kind of like I was always good at art at school, um, always told by teachers I was going to be an artist and I kind of assumed that would just happen for me and it wasn't until I got to about like year 10 so this is Australia so that would be about I don't know, 16 that I had a careers advisor sort of burst my bubble and tell me that uh, if I pursued art I would basically die poor and alone yeah and I was 16 at the time and I you know I grew up in a family we didn't have a lot of money so I just thought you know what bugger that I want to earn a good living. So I actually got into graphic design instead, sort of freaked out and and, uh, changed my mind, did graphic design and did that for about 10 years, worked as a corporate designer. And the whole time kind of in the back of my mind regretted giving up my dreams of becoming an artist and was, was quite frustrated about it. But at the same time, I just couldn't think of a direction I wanted to go in. Like I had a few kind of aborted attempts where, you know, I thought I'm going to paint cows which in hindsight is a weird thing to do or you know like greeting cards or and you know I'd go off on these little tangents and I was so scared of failing I never really gave it everything anyway so yeah it I basically just sort of dicked around with doing bits and pieces and and did graphic design until I think about 2011 I moved to Western Australia to Perth and I took up surfing because I was bored And just for fun, I painted my first surfboard and I did all this research on the internet to figure out how to do it, how do you prepare the board, talked to my local shaper who gave me some advice and I thought, you know what, 
I'm just going to film this and chuck it up on YouTube. So I did that. And when I was signing the board, I just signed it Fieldy. And that was essentially the genesis of my art career as Fieldy, because that's not my real name. Yeah. And so from then on, um, a guy that I worked with was like, oh, that's really cool. You should do more surfboards. So I just started painting surfboards and I painted like, I don't know, a dozen. And they each one evolved and got better and more. Uh, I learned to paint, which was a big deal because I used to be a sketcher. You know, at the end of that time, I had about, I don't know, 12 surfboards. I started sending like pictures of them out to different, uh, you know, sort of surf press stuff and largely was ignored. Um, or mm-hmm. I had people respond and say, oh, yeah, these are cool, but they're weird and there's strange, dark religious undertones and, hmm, we don't really know what to make of these. So hmm. yeah, that was the start. And where did it go from there? Like who ended up starting to purchase them or um, did you get like clients in that way? Luckily for me, actually, um, having studied graphic design, it actually turned out to be really good because uh, it kind of put me ahead of the game online in the sense that I could edit and post videos. I created my own logo and website and social media account, which looked quite professional. So it made me look as if I'd been around a lot longer, which sounds a little bit disingenuous, but it actually worked out really well. Um, I had thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to go into painting surfboards. And the dudes that I um, worked with at the Surfboard Shapers uh, sort of burst that bubble because they're like, well, Fieldy, pretty much no one's going to pay more than 200 bucks for a painted surfboard. And I just thought, well, you, you know, you can't make a living off that. And one of my primary drivers was if I was going to, at the age of 28, uh, make the push into art, it, it had to make money. Like I didn't want to work as a barista or as a waitress to support my art career I pretty much just said to myself this has to it has to make money you know I have to I have to enjoy it so I basically put out my website um started trying to get a following on social media and then uh little by little uh commissions started coming in and at that same time I was working freelance and design So I was kind of doing three or four days a week design and then one or two days art and I kept just painting more surfboards off the off the cuff. And then over time, the design kind of faded out and as the commission started coming in. Right. It it did have to make money, but you're able to make it so that it like you could kind of balance the scales and uh, kind of ease off of, uh, you know, the design. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of it was sheer luck. Um, and timing because also at the same time in the city I live in Perth uh, went through a massive uh, street art boom so there was just so much money here for that kind of thing so I started out doing surfboards moved into skateboards and then moved into street art as well so I got a lot of work probably two or three years into it um, doing murals and street art for businesses and schools and councils and things like that. Right. Well, and you mentioned doing or like kind of um, half putting a half effort kind of into different things like, oh, maybe I'll do greeting cards or maybe I'll do this. Um, What was it then about like the surfboards that like stuck? Was it um, the fact that you did start start to see money or was it just like the kind of joy of doing it? It was it was the second one. Actually, it was it turned Mm. out to be perfect because even though it never turned out to be, um, you know, a viable art career in the sense that um, particularly where I live, I couldn't be a full-time surfboard painter. It was just that lucky coincidence of the shape and the surface of the surfboards along with an idea that I had. I would embody each board with a funny character um, Mm. and create, you know, a design around this character. That was what gave me the focus to develop my style. So at first I'd been kind of, wandering around blind and not knowing what I wanted to do because I could do many different things. I didn't have a particularly distinctive style. The things that make surfboards difficult, which is the shape and the fact that you can't just use any old materials on it, were the things in the end that crafted my style and created it. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? That like sometimes having those kind of limitations or those like restrictions on yourself can like really open things up, (laughs) like as opposed to being able to do anything at all. You've totally hit the nail on the head. That is exactly right. An older friend of mine who's a um, a well-known sculptor, actually, she sort of said to me, 
if you don't know what you want to do or you don't know what your style is, create limitations for yourself. So the limitations were created in part because of the actual uh, object I was painting on. Everything had to be kind of long and skinny and stuff. And also I couldn't paint at the time. I was pretty rubbish at it. So another thing that I kind of adopted was this kind of old school tattoo style outlines because I felt more comfortable outlining things as though I was drawing and things like that. It just built on top of each other, those limitations to create a style, which later on I had to, you know, when those limitations no longer served me, I had to bust out of them and take the things that were good and that worked really well and then move that and progress that into other surfaces and other sized things. Right. And, and you definitely do have a very distinct style. Like you can look at anything and just know that it's a fieldy. Um, but can you talk about that process then of honing in on, on your style, figuring out what works and then being able to like, like you said, bust out? Well, as I said before, I think a lot of it was actually because of the, the limitations of my own technical skills at first. At the start, my very first surfboard that I did called the Fishwife, uh, which is a joke, by the way, because the surfboard was a, uh, a fish-style surfboard. So mm-hmm. anyway, um, <laughs> I basically used very, very basic um, spray painting techniques in the background. And then over top, I painted this figure, which was super basic, just white, a white fish-headed woman with uh, some dark gray shading, which was really blocky because I couldn't really blend acrylics very well with like big chunky old school tattoo outlines. So they were that was simple to do. It was doable and I could achieve it and it would still look good. And then the second one, I kind of pushed it a little further. I, you know, added more colors. Probably about the first four surfboards, four to five, I wasn't blending the paint though. I would mix, say, for instance, a middle tone of the paint and then I'd mix a shadow and a highlight and keep them sealed up in little, you know, Chinese food containers and Mm -hmm. um, sort of keep them there in case I made a mistake so I could touch it up. But it was kind of really uh, non-blended, really cartoony. And then over time, as I got more confident, uh, I started to, the paint became, the painting side became more realistic until, you know, like five years later, I could paint things with like quotey fingers, realistic. But I always kept the outlines on there because I know I really enjoy doing the outlines and it covers up a lot of mistakes, actually. You don't have to be a very tidy painter if you can bung those outlines on and pull the whole piece together at the end, which sounds terrible, actually, me saying that out loud. <laughs> but, okay. And I did consider getting rid of the outlines. Um, probably about a year or so ago, I went through a bit of a crisis with my art and I, I thought, you know, do these still serve me? Because, I mean, they were created that, like adding the outlines. One, because I liked old school tattoo art but mainly because I just technically wasn't very good at the time. So at the moment, I'm kind of going through a process of juxtaposing uh, realistic painting and figuring out where the outlines fit in because on their own, they are also quite beautiful. So my job, I guess, at the moment is to figure out a way to utilize both of those skills and make it kind of cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think you you do do that. And uh, it's important to, I think all artists, all creative people kind of go through that process where it's like, okay, is this old style that, you know, I've almost, I don't think you ever master it, but like almost mastered it. um, And you're kind of itching to kind of go in a new direction. It's really scary to do that because of the fact that you solved this big problem, (laughs) this like huge problem that artists have of like, all right, what am I going to do? You figure that thing out, but then like your heart's telling you to go in a different direction. Do you have any advice then for for anyone that maybe finds themselves in a similar crisis of identity, um, how to start to comfortably move on? <laughs> oh, oh, man, I am the wrong person <laughs> to ask right now. I, uh, I basically, I will answer that question in a second by way of a parable. Um, yes. I basically, about for a year and a half ago, I was just churning out heaps and heaps of commissions and felt like by my own definition of success at the start that I had quite a fingers, made it. I was making a good living. I was getting heaps of work. But I felt like a lot of my work was very much always the same. I was kind of pigeonholed as a particular type of artist, which is totally cool. That is also how I had kind of promoted myself. I, you know, I realized I was very privileged to be able to make a living uh, out of art. But at the same time, I was burnt out and I 
I didn't know what I wanted to do anymore. And I was at that stage that you're talking about where you need to progress, but you don't know how. And if you're being paid to create work for somebody else, it's very difficult to experiment when you're in that kind of sphere. So I actually took 14 months off and went driving around South America with my husband. Um, Nice. Yeah, it was rad. We bought a car in Chile and drove up to Colombia and back down. Um, And I've only been back actually for about three months. And so right now I've had all that. I've seen some really, really cool art. I got to paint some free murals, which was uh, really cool in Colombia and in Chile and, and experiment and have the freedom to just kind of have some fun with it rather than it being, you know, work. And so I'm exactly in that phase now that you're talking about, which is, you know, what do you want to do? How do you take what you do now and then progress it? But even scarier is that idea of where, if you don't know where you want it to go to yet, it's kind of almost quite shockingly like being not quite at square one again, but it feels a little bit like you're in that space again. And I didn't expect that at the start. I, I guess I always just thought you would just keep progressing and then you would reach a stage where you were like, yeah, I'm super happy with this. Good on me. Pat <laughs> yourself on the back, high five yourself. But no, um, I guess it doesn't, it doesn't work out like that. And that's what keeps it exciting, I think. And that's part of why being an artist or working in art or any of the creative fields, it's a lifelong endeavor because it changes as you change. Right. Yeah. I think it's like anything else. It's like, once you get that, you know, comfortable feeling, you know, that like you might be starting to get not, not stagnant, but um, you're not pushing yourself maybe, or not um, experimenting where the whole you know, thing that made you want to be a creative person is those exciting feelings, those like nervous feelings of the unknown and and creating something new. So it does feel like getting back to square one when you want to kind of shake things up again. But sometimes that's a good thing to have those, those feelings, you know? No, you're exactly right. It's, it's those feelings that you have that feel horrible. You know, at the time you're like, I can't believe I feel like this. You know, I shouldn't feel like this. I should, I'm very lucky and la 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 la, you know, um, those feelings are barometer that you need to change things in your life or you need to change things in your art career and that it's time to move on. And it's a scary place to be, but it's it's the point where you're poised to jump into something different and new or maybe just tweak something old and create something new out of it. It's, it's actually an exciting sphere and I'm kind of hoping, I mean, I'm sure a lot of your other guests have uh, dealt with this before and come out the other side and, and have better advice. But personally, what I'm going to try to do is I'm kind of interested in exploring uh, different artistic mediums and things. I'd really like to move into oil paints because I feel like some of the stuff that I want to be able to do and some of the effects I want to get are somewhat limited by acrylic paints. Um, so I want to jump into oil paints and see where that leads. And And I think it might be fun to do some uh, you know, like workshops and courses on something that's totally unrelated, like um, maybe sculpting or, you know, something that just forces your brain out of its rut or out of its kind of like, I know how to do this kind of way of thinking and get your brain active again and thinking and inspired and, and so that you can jump back into experimentation. Right. That's like the perfect advice because when you do that, like you don't know what you don't know. (laughs) So whenever you can like, you know, force yourself into like a completely new um, medium or environment and do something completely new, you're, you're learning something totally different and you can bring all of these new things that you had no idea you were going to learn or think about in this new way back into your old stuff. If you decide to kind of go back, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's also like, you don't have to like chuck everything out. Um, like I'm certainly not intending to throw away everything I've learned and, you know, oh, here we go, the outlines again. Um, I'm just going to be a bit more choosy and a bit more smart about how I use them or, you know, how do I integrate that with fine art oil painting techniques, you know, to create something unexpected. And I have kind of an idea in my head. I just – and I've been slowly experimenting with it, but I haven't um, – sort of sat down with it yet and just reeled out painting after painting like I did initially with the surfboards. And that's probably what I need to do at this point is just sit down and start painting things without worrying about where it's going to go, who's going to buy it or anything like that, just doing it for the fun of it. 
Absolutely. And I can't wait to see it maybe on your YouTube channel, uh, which, which actually kind of like leads me to my next question. Like as you're, you know, going through like this learning process of reshaping who Fieldy is or, or, or what your style is, and you're trying to, you know, figure this out for yourself, but you're also creating like YouTube videos and, you know, um, tutorials and stuff like that. And like putting yourself out there in that way. Um, what is that experience like to be kind of changing but also inviting people into that experience of, of seeing you change or try new things or, uh, you know, whatever you may show. I don't think that I've um, kind of discussed it uh, publicly yet, like what I've been doing or, or what I'm thinking about. I sometimes post things on Instagram or make videos about some of the new and more experimental things that I'm doing. Uh, but what I've kind of enjoyed is I've just wrapped up filming a tutorial on painting shoes And that's kind of been fun because I'd never used those paints before, haven't really painted on shoes before. So it's doing things that I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily going to go into painting shoes as a business idea, but that has been really fun to just kind of push yourself a little bit to try new things and think about things differently. So, I mean, maybe in the future I'll I'll do a few more things around, you know, changing a style and, and what that's like. And definitely I think it might help to do some videos uh, for other people out there in the same kind of situation. But I tend to want to talk about or teach about things that I uh, I feel like I have, if not worked out, I can at least offer some advice which I myself would take, if that makes sense. I feel a bit, I feel a bit scared about uh, just yeah, – that's a good question. I haven't thought about actually just um, – putting a video out on YouTube and, and sort of talking about, you know, being in this particular stage because it's um, – I'm sure almost everybody goes through it, but I'm not sure what, how they how they get through it or, you know, what the answer is. Right. I, I do think that everybody does go through it. That's kind of the whole purpose of this <laughs> this podcast, you know, try to help people get through that or, or figure it out. I don't know if anybody has it figured out, um, but to at least, like, discuss it to show that, like, you know – it is natural. It is normal. You're not weird for, for having like a, a crisis or for, you know, wanting to, to change, even though things have been working before. Um, but even like a, a good example of like how open and honest you are is like, um, you had this one video where one of your murals got like vandalized and as you were fixing it, which I like, I feel like I would be like too frustrated to even like want to like fix it or spend all that time. But then you, you know, you make a video of you fixing it and in the video, you made a mistake of, um, using like the wrong reference photo. Oh yeah. And I was like, I, I was like, that's like such a brave thing to do to show that you did that, to say that you did that and to show like the process of fixing it. I feel like it would just be like natural instinct to, to just like edit that out um, and just like pretend like you started from, from phase one. So like, I think you do have that kind of um, personality that you want to show like the full process and show that mistakes do get made, you know? Well, I think that's the, the thing. Um, and that's what I've noticed from having a YouTube channel is that so many people uh, comment and message me and they're so they're so afraid of making mistakes. And at the the start, I was terrified of making mistakes as well. I was terrified of failing. And I was terrified of people being mean to me, I guess, you know, Mm -hmm. people not liking it. Because at the start, it was all so raw and so personal. And I hadn't inhabited it yet in terms of I hadn't, you know, I still thought, oh, my God, I'm a corporate designer who's playing at doing this. I'm going to get found (laughs) out. Right. Imposter syndrome. Yes, imposter syndrome. Yes, exactly. I sort of like my career path has been defined by mistakes and not even mistakes, kind of wrong turns. You know, I tried T-shirts, I tried surfboards, I tried all these different things and they're not really mistakes. Well, none of them were actually a major mistake. They were, they were things that I thought would work out that didn't and I learned something from every single one of those and I think the internet is full of lies <laughs> <laughs> which comes as a surprise to no one, but it's people carefully curating their, their online images. It's artists only posting their best work, which is, you know, is good because, you know, you want people to buy your work and trust you to paint their things. But um, I think it paints a, a not real picture of what it's actually like. I still make so many mistakes when I paint. 
Um, I'll repaint faces three or four times sometimes until I'm happy with them. And so I thought for that particular video that I would show people how to fix those mistakes or what I do to fix them. So instead of having a major freak out, which is what I used to do when I made a, a bit of a whoopsie or like a fairly big whoopsie, I now have a process that I go through to fix it. And having a process and having a system is what makes you feel more secure, which is a bit like um, another thing that's very close to my heart is the thing that I call the fear, which is, you know, just when you start a work or you're, say, halfway through it and suddenly you think that you hate it and you don't want to work on it anymore and you basically freak out and think that you're a terrible artist and a rubbish human being. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) <laughs> which you know I at the start I thought it was only me that that had that um and I created a video around it because um you know I realized through the help of a book that it's just a normal part of the creative process and part of the creative process is making mistakes when you paint or draw or sculpt or whatever and sometimes those mistakes are awesome and it's a happy mistake that you can leave in there which leads to new and interesting things Or sometimes, you know, you've painted someone's eyes too close together and it sucks, but, you know, part of the thing that's great about paint is you just keep painting until you're happy with it. It's no big deal. It's normal. Absolutely. What what book was that? Oh, it's called, hang on, just give me a second and I'll look it up. It's by Elizabeth Gilbert. Oh, Big Magic? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. (laughs) A friend lent it to me and I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Yeah. But I read it and I was like, Oh my God, it's true. It's just a part of the process. For sure. Yeah. And I, I'm i trying to think of like a good like hashtag or some kind of movement to get people to start sharing like imperfections or mistakes because I think it's so important. I think you're right. The internet is a huge lie, like not just with like artists and creative people, but just with, with everybody and, and their perfect plates of food and their perfect makeup and their perfect bodies or, or whatever, like people are putting forth their best self, which makes a lot of sense. And like you get to do that. But at the same time, it makes it really hard for somebody that's trying to progress or somebody that wants to show like what real life really is like, which I think is really important. I don't know. There needs to be some kind of movement where we just <laughs> show like our shit, you know, just show the shitty first drafts, our shitty rough drafts or the things that didn't make it or the things that haven't made it yet, um, as opposed to only showing our finished finished works, you know? That's exactly right. That's why I love showing the ugly stage when I'm painting. So uh, for anyone who's not familiar with that, it's pretty much just, uh, you know, when you start painting. I don't know if it's the same with drawing, but I know particularly with painting, you start blocking in all the colors and it just looks like a giant turd. (laughs) It just looks weird. (laughs) Yeah. It looks so bad. And, you know, at the start, that would be the stage I would freak out. Whereas now, you know, I'm a little bit older. I've done a lot of paintings. I'm like, yeah, it's the ugly stage. An artist friend of mine was actually like, oh, yeah, that's the ugly stage. So I, mm-hmm. I like to post a photo of that because it looks ridiculous. But it's part of the faith that you have in the process. You know that if you keep painting, it's going to progress. And it does turn a corner where it goes from ugly stage and then it starts to <laughs> turn into something else. But I love posting the ugly stage photos so that people will just be like, holy shit, is that how it starts out? You know? <laughs> right. Well, it's it's really important to do, especially for people that don't have a lot of experience being in the ugly stage because they're so scared of being in the starting phase, you know, or getting to an ugly phase or getting to a like crisis mode where, the, oh, this is shit and I'm a terrible human being or whatever you said. Like, yeah. it's it's really scary to get, to get to that point if you've never been there. So it like it takes getting to that ugly stage over and over and over again and kind of living in that stage for a long time to realize that, oh, there's a stage after this. And I most of the time get to that stage. It's like, you just need to like be in it and if you haven't been in there like long enough to feel comfortable there it's really tough when everybody's showing like the literally final phase (laughs) no that's exactly right and it's it's just all literally all you're doing is the more you do it the more you do you know paint the ugly stage and then turn it into something really cool is you're proving to your brain that you can do it and then you will start to trust yourself and you'll start to trust the process and I mean, I still do the ugly stage and go, sometimes go, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. <laughs> what, what position have I put myself in? <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. Or sometimes I'll be like, everything will be going really well. I'll be out of the ugly stages. I'll be really getting stuck in, having fun, listening to podcasts like this one. And then, you know, I'll just take a look at it and realize normally it's quite, something quite small. Like, or, you know, I'll go make a cup of tea and come back and look at it and go, oh, sweet Jesus, I have stuffed it. I have done X, Y, or Z. And normally it's something really little, like their mouth is on a slightly wrong angle or, you know, like you need to boost shadows and highlights. But, like, sometimes if you're overtired and you've been working on it too long or you're too emotionally invested, you just freak out, you know. Rather, And that's when I find that you have to turn it around so you can't see it if possible, you know, like it has to – If it's a mural and it just has to be done, then you've just got to push yourself. But if it's something that you can have a day away from, the best thing to do is just put it aside, go work on something else, go for a walk, go watch YouTube or whatever you do to relax and just get it away from your eyes for a little bit because when you look at it the next day or the day after, you'll realize that it's actually just a really small fix that you need to do normally. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of, you know, going fast and going hard and going for a long time, but sometimes like enough's enough (laughs) and you just need that break from it uh, because you're not going to do any good if you just keep trying to fix it at that moment. Yeah, I I think because that used to disturb me more than the ugly ugly stages was the fear stage Mm -hmm. Um, and that used to really freak me out. Before I read that book, I was just kind of like, I shouldn't still be having this, you know. Uh, I should still be, I should be really confident because, you know, I can, I know I can fix it or la la la. But I sort of came to the realization that for me, uh, if I am feeling that, it means that I'm emotionally invested in the outcome. It means that I'm doing my best and I want this to be a really good job. So I think if I didn't worry at, at a certain stage that I wasn't doing my best, I think I'd just be, you know, just painting any old thing and, and not giving a shit either way which would be pretty sad ultimately. Mm. So sometimes things like that and the fear that you, that you have as a creative is actually a good thing because it's keeping you honest and making you do your best work. Right. I think one of the the fears that uh, is not a good thing though, is you mentioned it before, like that fear of people being mean. (laughs) I think that that kind of stops people from sharing their work or sharing, you know, the ugly phase or sharing even the finished phase. Um, In your experience, like how many times have people been mean to you though? (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, I was expecting so much pushback. Um, At the start, I was just absolutely terrified. I was terrified of people being mean. I think I was a bit scared, weirdly, of what my friends and family would think about Mm. it because they know me personally. In fact, I created a pseudonym for myself, Fieldy, so that people wouldn't know who I really was. Like, I was that that kind of scared about it all. And, you know, I also felt like um, or was worried that being, um, you know, being a woman, painting in a very male-dominated sphere. So at the time it was like a lot of uh, surfboards, skateboards, maybe street art murals as well, a little bit. I was like, oh, man, people are going to be really mean to me and, you know, putting out YouTube tutorials as well in those fields. I was like, oh, man, it's going to be horrible. Um, And the truth was uh, on YouTube I've had maybe, I don't know, um, in in eight, no, what is it, like seven years I've had maybe like, four mean comments like (laughs) properly mean ones and in real life you know I've um I've had people who haven't understood what I was doing at the start because it was like my surfboard art was so weird and unusual and I've also had people who don't dig it you know it's not their thing and over time I've learned to just be you know I still get a little bit miffed (laughs) about it but I've learned over time to try and Um, not take it personally and that is kind of the hardest thing with art because to you it is personal and you know I still when I do a commission I you know of course I really really hope they're going to love it and do my best so that they will love it but the hardest thing to learn is not to take it personally and I think that's a bit of a lifelong journey because the more important the work is to you the more of yourself and your emotional self that you put into it the harder it's going to be if people say things about it but there's no way around it. You either hide all your work and never show anyone and then, then you know, what's kind of what's the point or you have to put on your big kid's pants and get it out into the world and, 
and somewhat be prepared that not everyone is going to like it. In the same way that not everyone is going to like you as a person, not everyone is going to like what you do. Right. And that, and that's a good thing too. And I I think a lot of people, their initial fear is like that all these people are going to come out and, and say, oh, like you are, <laughs> you are an imposter. Like you, you, you're not supposed to do this or, or say like just mean things, but like nobody's, nobody really says mean things, like even on the internet, like there's very, very few mean comments that the tricky thing though, is when you do share it, especially to somebody that, you know, you're close with and they just don't get it. And that's, I think something that people need to get over. Like not everybody's going to get it. The best thing you can do is like, just put as much of yourself into it and try to make them understand (laughs) or see kind of like this side of you or that like you're kind of bearing your soul with this, you know, creative output. But at the end of the day, like you can't make them understand it. And most of the time you don't want everybody to get it anyway. I think that's exactly right. And there is a tightrope that has to be walked because sometimes people are reacting to what you're doing. They don't get it, which is, which is fine. But there's other times when I produce stuff um, where it's just not good enough really, or there's been something wrong with it. And that's why it's useful. Um, I think it's actually incredibly useful if you if you can to have somebody close to you who supports what you do in the sense of probably not financially, but um, <laughs> you know, emotionally is emotionally supportive of your journey, but who is honest. So uh, at the start, my husband, who wasn't my husband at the time, was like, "Yeah, you know, go ahead, pursue your art dreams." And every time I would say, "No." Oh, I can't do it. I'm going to give up. I'm rubbish. I'm ugly and my mother hates me. <laughs> he, would, he would say, no, keep painting, keep going. But at the same time, he was, he's, well, he still is super honest. So um, sometimes he's now too picky, but he'll look at an artwork and be like, yeah, look, it's good. <laughs> but Mm, there's something a bit odd about the eyes or this and that and and sometimes you know I don't want to hear that I'm like oh you know you don't you just don't get it it looks like you don't get it he's meant to have one eye bigger than the other um, <laughs> but like most of the time he's actually right and um and that that also is another thing that kind of keeps me honest to myself and because like when you're painting or drawing or whatever Uh, constructing a piece of music or writing when you're close to it you don't see it for how it really is so that second pair of eyes is really helpful Uh, especially if if they're a sympathetic pair of eyes and they they do understand what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go with it but they can also tell you if there's something that you're missing because you've been looking at it for too long Um, so yeah it's that kind of weird weird thing where in some ways you have to follow your own heart and you have to find your own vision but there's a difference between people being mean, people not getting it, and people offering you um, actual uh, criticism and critiques that you would do well to take on board. And the trick is figuring out which one it is. Right, exactly. That's the, it is so valuable to have that. I have that with my wife too, with with my writing especially. Like sometimes you know, like you said, you're too close to it. Like, okay, I literally wrote this. <laughs> so of course, like, it's going to make sense to me. But then she reads it and she's like, I don't get it. And I'm like, well, no, of course you don't get it. Like, like you can't take it too personally where she's just like, no, like I literally don't understand like the, the words that you put together. It doesn't make grammatical sense. And then I'm like, oh, okay, like I can see where you're coming from now. It's But like also like somebody that's not just going to say, um, oh yeah, this is great. And not tell you like that glaring, like inconsistency or that glaring mistake that you made. They love you and they want you to like not put yourself out there in a bad way. So like, yeah, like you said, finding that kind of trusted, not even critic, just like editor, um, that will, that will tell you like it is, but also be like super supportive. It's like so rare, but so important. That that was hard. When I first started out, uh, Mitch, my husband, because he's a really cool guy and he's really nice. He actually at the start, like as he was encouraging me to keep doing art, he actually wouldn't critique anything I did. So I would show him things and I knew something was wrong with it. And he would go, oh, it's really nice. Or, oh, Mm -hmm. it's really cool. And I was like, don't be an asshole. Um, (laughs) I know there's something wrong with this. I just don't know what. I need you to be my eyes. And I promise I won't be mad at you. And, you know, once he realized that I wasn't going to, like, fall apart or get angry at him or dump him if he was (laughs) was actually honest, it's it's a huge help 
you know, having somebody else that you trust and you trust their opinion and their taste and, you know, they're not in competition with you, you know, as sometimes another artist might be, to look at it and just give you their opinion. Also, if they're a layman, that's also wicked as well because they aren't kind of bound by the same mm-hmm. rules that you think you are, if you know what I mean. They, they, they come at things from a completely different angle, so that's also really helpful. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you talk about being too close to something because you created it, but it's it's nice to also have that level of distance from, you know, the 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 medium as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, they're not bound by the same rules that you are. And also they know what a face is meant to look like. They know uh how words are meant to go together to mm-hmm. make something other than I don't know, word salad. So <laughs> yeah, it's it is really helpful. I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, it is your choice if you take their advice or take anybody's advice. And, you know, that's part of the learning process is then questioning yourself. Do I want to fix this? Or being like, no, you know what? I want uh, part of this left unfinished because that's part of the, the painting. That's part of what I'm saying in this piece. Right. Well, okay. So we've, we've established that people aren't that mean, um, no. but I have to ask you about that video we were talking about before with your mural getting vandalized where people just like literally just what poured paint on it like paintballs what the yeah they paint they paint bombed it okay so you handled that very cool in the video <laughs> like you're like oh, okay like I'll just redo it it could have done it like my style's changed a little bit and I'll just redo it but like what was that like initially like when you saw it and you're like oh my god like this is some like did you take it personally or like did you cry I would have cried (laughs) yeah that one that one's a weird one um because I think it it's to do with a, a point in time that's happening in the city I live in there is becoming a bit of a pushback against street art um because a lot of it's become very sanitized and so my uh my pet my mural wasn't the only one that got paint bombed in the area anybody who had a portrait or a face got paint bombed so it's obviously someone with like a a bit of an axe to grind um and I was away at the time so someone sent me a photo and I was like oh man that sucks but you know I'd, I'd kind of been waiting for it for a long time I knew there was a chance that my work would get um vandalized and this actually worked out quite well because I'd come home to paint for a month and the city council paid me to repaint it. So I was like, mm. woohoo, thank you, paint bomber. Um, Did you paint bomb it? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily I was taken out of the equation because I was in Colombia at the time. So, um, Okay, all right. Wasn't me. But good, was, good alibi. But And, you know, I made the video around it. So I was like, you know what, F you, person who paint bombed this, you don't get the last laugh. Uh, they kind of did though because then after I repainted it they rebombed it and then someone mm. actually tagged over it like uh, I really really pissed them off <laughs> um, but at that stage I was like you know what I got the photos I got uh, I got a video I got paid and I got the knowledge that I have progressed a lot as an artist you know repainting that mural I got to see just how far I'd come So I kind of just took it philosophically and or as philosophically as I could and then try to worry about it because, you know, you can't if you're putting stuff out in public like that, particularly with street art, you you, there's no way that you can protect it from, you know, everything that's going to happen to it. And and you put it out there with the knowledge it's temporary. And that's what's kind of that's what I like about it, actually, is that it is temporary. It only exists in a certain place for a certain amount of time. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask if that um, makes you kind of falter or makes you kind of hesitate to, to make a mural in the future. I guess it, it does help if, if you're getting paid for it. So like your time is paid for. Um, but like when it comes to doing like free stuff or just like stuff that you want to do, does that ever make you hesitate? Oh, yeah, I did one in um, Colombia and um because i did a f- uh, like quite a few free ones and it was really fun and this was on uh the outside of a uh bakery for dogs um really randomly that's cool <laughs> yeah. it, and it was like it was really fun i think i spent three days painting it um, made a video of it and found out on instagram i know a few months ago that the owners had decided to paint over half the mural with a big sign saying panaderia canina or whatever it was called and I was like you've got to be kidding me um but then I thought you know what 
I, I had the fun experience of painting it. I made a fun video about it. I've got the photos. It's, you know, I think after you do it, you've just got to let go of it to the best of your ability. Just let go and just say it's more about the experience and and what you learn in doing it than the actual final outcome. But really recommend getting good quality photos because even though the, the work itself may be gone or changed or ruined, you've always got the photos. So, you know, it still exists in some form somewhere. I mean, it is a bit of a bummer. Like the repaint job, you know, I was pretty stoked with the outcome. Um, so, yeah, that, would, that one stung quite a bit. Uh, when it when it happened but then I recognized you know I'm like okay well this is a learning curve it's the first time this has really happened you know it sucks but apart from the council anti-graffiti coding it there's nothing that could have could be done you know right yeah absolutely um well before we get to the the final push I wanted to ask you like just to like think back to the the sixteen year old you when you're that, that career counselor is telling you that you're not going to make money and like really kind of shifted your your mindset about like where you wanted to go. What would you say if you could go back in time and and talk to the sixteen year old Fieldy? Uh, what would you say to her? Well, I mean, if it was talking to myself, I'd be like, "Hey, everything's going to turn out fine. Don't worry about it." But I think if I was talking to a general person. Um, I would say, you know what, it's actually not a bad thing to have another career as well as art or, you know, instead of art, because, I mean, unless you've got a trust fund or you marry someone rich <laughs> or, I don't know, unless, unless you're just you're really well off and you don't need to work, the reality is most of us need to make money at some stage during our lives. So it's totally cool to to do something else first or do something else at the same time. I mean. Graphic design has been hugely helpful for my art career. It's helped me be able to do all the stuff like create a cool website, do my own marketing. Um, you know, I've saved a lot of money through that kind of thing. But it's also changed the way I thought about art. I actually came at it when I decided to quote fingers. <laughs> I'm saying this ironically. Be an artist it made me think of it as a business instead of just like an airy fairy thing. It made me approach it as a business, how will I get clients, you know, um, and things like that. So, you know, I would say to people, it's not actually, despite what it sounds like, it's not a bad thing to study graphic design or some other kind of satellite career that will keep you going in the lean times or keep you going while you're just starting out. Right. Yeah. I think everybody, um, has had that kind of a person that, that career counselor or that parent or that teacher or whatever that kind of tries to turn them in a different direction or you know for their own good they're they're doing it at, like as good advice but yeah sometimes it is good advice to to think of it as a business and think of the fact that there are bills to pay especially if you want to go to school um <laughs> or rent or not live in your parents basement forever um it is important to think of those things so yeah sometimes that advice isn't necessarily bad advice no not at all and i think sometimes just not being i think another thing that i would say to people who want to make it their main career and this isn't meant to sound negative because I realized that all of us who do have it as our main career are incredibly privileged is that once it becomes your job it's different you know once mm -hmm. it's something that you're relying on to pay the bills it's still fun it's still cool and it's still the best job in the world but it won't be like when it was your hobby it it can't be it's just different you're beholden to clients you're beholden to collectors or the people who are basically paying you. So it's anyone who thinks that in quitting their job and becoming an artist, it's going to be the most amazing thing ever and it'll be super fun. Yeah, some of the time it will be. And I definitely love it and wouldn't do any other job in the world, but it does come with its own challenges and things like that, that, that you may not expect when you're starting out. For sure. It's like sometimes you, you know, you fill that, that void or you can fill that job with the thing that you love, but then that becomes a job and it's like, all right, now I need to find a new thing <laughs> that may, that gets me excited and gets me like really going. Um, or, or something that, as we said before, puts me in that kind of uncomfortable position where I'm really pushing myself. It's like never balanced, you know? <laughs> no, exactly right. And there's like, there's artists that I know that are really well known for a particular style of art. And 
um, once they're really, really well known for that, it's really hard to bust out of that because that's mm. what people want to buy. That's what they want you to create. Um, so in a sense, it's a little bit like painting yourself into a corner um, in that it's a wonderful place to be because, you know, you've made it in the sense that people love your work and they're paying you to do it, but it becomes very hard to change it after that stage, I think. You've got to be very brave and be prepared to lose customers and clients and followers and, and you know, um, just and, and have uh, have faith in the process. Absolutely. Well, Fieldy, it is time for the final push. And that's where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best final words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Ready? Is everybody ready? This is my sage words of advice that I would also tell to younger me as well, which is if you don't ask, you don't get. And that's pretty much goes for anything in life, but particularly in your art career, don't be afraid to hear no. It's horrible at the start and you'll take it really personally, but the more times that you ask for things, the more times that you show people your work, the more times you put yourself in that very uncomfortable place, of being on a limb and where people can see your work and critique it and tell you no, the further your career will go. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's like we were talking about before with the, you know, the ugly phase, being comfortable, being in the ugly phase, you got to be uncomfortable or you got to be comfortable also being in that rejection phase of just building up immunity to rejections. And eventually the, those yeses do come through, but you do have to put yourself in that kind of uncomfortable, scary place. So important. Yeah, and the thing is, and the thing that's kind of was surprising and isn't now in hindsight, is that there's never a stage where these don't apply. Like, you make mistakes your whole art career, you know, including silly things like um, painting a face the wrong way. You still make mistakes like that. You still get upset if someone tells you no or um, someone rejects your work or you don't get in on an exhibition you thought that you should be involved in. And you still do get anxious about producing the work and whether it's good enough. Like that never goes away. The only thing that changes is you become more resilient to it and you can have a moment where you freak out about it and then just go, you know what? I've been through all this before. I've come out the other end. I learned a lot of lessons. It's okay. It's just part of the process. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for, for kind of sharing your journey and telling us like about, you know, the fact that you're going through a kind of a change or, you know, thinking about changing things up too, because I think it's it's so important. I'm really, really excited to see um, where you end up. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> see, And that's part of the exciting part, I guess. Exactly. Um, well, Fieldy, thank you so much for coming on the show today, uh, for sharing your journey and for push giving us that push today. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for asking me. Oh, of course. And and you can find Fieldy on our website, fieldy.com. That's F-I-E-L-D-E-Y.com. And on Instagram, she is Fieldy. And we'll have everything um, where you can find Fieldy at yourcreativepush.com slash Fieldy. Fieldy, thanks again. Thank you. I could talk to Fieldy for hours. <laughs> My thanks once again to her for coming on the show. You know, on the show recently, we've been talking a lot about limitations or restrictions and the weird way in which they can open things up and actually really open up your creativity as opposed to, well, limiting it. And I want you to think about and really take a deep dive, whether you're journaling or just sitting in silence for the next five minutes or meditating on it tomorrow. Um, and just think about the forms of art or subject matters or materials or or even surface areas that you yourself have pushed aside because of the limitations or restrictions that they might provide. And I actually think this is a very hard activity to do and why it requires journaling or sitting in, in silence and really thinking hard about it because – it's hard to figure out what your subconscious is is throwing out and deeming uh, an impossibility for you before your thinking brain even gets a chance to 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 mull it over and to critically decide whether or not it's an actual possibility for you. 
your thinking brain can't even be trusted, let alone your subconscious. So just try to think back to some of those ideas that might have made your heart flutter for a, a brief moment before being squashed by your subconscious and, and thrown away forever. I think these thoughts come and go like, oh, it'd be great to create music or, oh, it would be great to make a huge mural. Maybe you were inspired today by by Fieldy talking about making huge murals, um, but surely you can't make a, a huge mural because you don't have a big wall. But like maybe you do have a big wall or maybe you do have the opportunity to go out in your community and try to find somewhere that somebody that wants a mural or a place that you can make a mural, like you can actually do that thing. If you give yourself a chance to actually uh, come up with some of the logistics for it, you can actually make one of those things happen. So just take a moment and think about times in your past that maybe you have just squashed those ideas before actually considering them. And also promise yourself that in the future when you get those kinds of ideas that give you a little bit of excitement or you're like, oh, that'd be cool to do that, before you just throw that idea away, take the time to actually consider it. Take the time to actually figure out if it is a possibility for you and maybe just start it. Maybe just try it. Give yourself some limitations. Give yourself some restrictions and you might be surprised with what you come up with. And secondly, just a PSA that, you know, Fieldy made me think about in this episode. Take pictures of your work just in case you lose it <laughs> or just in case you're you're ashamed of it in the future and you end up burning it in a bonfire because you're so embarrassed of it. At least document your stuff um, like, like a CSI person would. <laughs> just get it in the file. You don't have to look at it ever again if you don't want to, but you never know when you'll need it in the future. And you don't have to be a hoarder, <laughs> but just be a hoarder of your your progress and your achievements. Simply creating something is an incredible achievement. So just give yourself that proof that you did create it and you are on this creative journey and actually creating a body of work, regardless of where it ends up. If it ends up in the trash or somebody else's wall, at least snap a pic. On our next episode, we have Limbo. Limbo is a musician from Los Angeles, and she comes on this show next week to talk about her creative process of developing a style, the challenges of making an album, of making a track, of building an audience, and also connecting with bigger artists to collaborate on. If you want to find out more about Limbo or check out her music, you can head to olimbo.com, O-H-L-I-M-B-O.com. And on SoundCloud, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere else, she is You Know Limbo. And of course, we'll have that all linked up at today's show notes page at yourcreativepush.com slash 308, as well as everything we talked about with Fieldy. But that's all I've got for you today. Hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done. Think about new limitations that you can give yourself and allow your brain to mull over the possibilities of those limitations and give yourself that chance. I love you all so much. Go get some amazing work done and we will see you next time. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.